Good morning, Bitcoin. My name is Thomas Hunt, and this is Proof of Work. Proof of Work is a show about the people behind Bitcoin and how they got here. I'm joined by Mike Dupree from EasyBit. How's it going, Mike? I'm well, thanks, Tom. It's beautiful here today at the Blockchain Hotel. It's nice to be in Essen. Good to be back in Germany. I hear they're having uh, actual speeches in German this afternoon, so probably better to be out here. Guess we can get our German practice in. Das is good. <laughs> Nicked. <laughs> so I'm going to start with everyone's most favorite and familiar question. What was your first computer? I can still remember it very clearly. When I got a Macintosh, I think it was a Power Mac. I Whoa. can't remember the model. I still have it. It's in my basement, my nice. parents' house uh, in Michigan. But uh, yeah, I remember when I got my first computer, absolutely. Was it I a big day? Your parents brought it home, or how did it happen? Like, yeah, I mean, it was. It was like the we went to Best Buy, yeah, a place that I haven't been in ten years. <laughs> uh, but we went to Best Buy, and uh, I'm pretty sure my father chunked out uh, half of his paycheck. Oh, but, it was uh, a big. It was a big purchase back in the day. It was um, really difficult to get a computer. It took a lot of sacrifice for sure. So. I don't even think back then that uh, I don't even think initially we had a modem. I mean, I think the. Uh, the first time I spent on the computer was mainly playing like, uh, you know, very, very basic games, just learning how it worked. And sure, sure. Yeah. Well, for a while, it was. I was just amazed to have a mouse. <laughs> like moving a mouse around was a whole new thing. Well, like you're a little was. older than me. My uh, my <laughs> first computer, we had a mouse and a graphical interface and all that, but. Uh, but the internet was very, very basic when mm. I when I was getting started. And so, so what did you do with the computer? What kind of things interested you inside of it? I, I think in the, in the beginning, like my parents did never use a computer and knew nothing about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just kind of interesting to kind of learn how it worked. And I can remember always just kind of playing with things, trying to, I was always copying files on the different uh, floppy disks and yeah, trying to yeah. compress things and trying to just experimenting and playing around and, and such like that. I mean, the first few the first few years that I had a computer, the majority of things I was using it for was just basic word processing, sure. and uh, you know, like being able to use the mouse and, and paint. I don't I, paint is a yeah. Windows application. Sure, thing, sure, like the Mac, I mean, Mac the, Paint or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. I think though, if I had to remember back in the early days of computing, I think the. The coolest thing in the, in the beginning of computing was when Napster came out. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, I mean, you had this whole community of people that were sharing music and it just changed the entire world of how we, how we find music, how we listen to music, how we enjoy music. I think that was probably the most, like, awakening point yeah, yeah. Uh, in the early days of computing uh, almost as cool as bitcoin even but i shouldn't have said that but yeah. well i i remember it i remember <laughs> at first well it was cool and then the torrents that came after it were you know technically really cool that was a technical thing and to be thing clear too. i'm not really big on the whole like software piracy stuff or downloading free music or whatever i'm sure. happy to pay for it or whatnot but instead of going to a record store and get advertised to this is what you should be buying or whatever. We mm -hmm. were communities of people talking about music, discussing music, yeah, yeah. and finding new music, which I thought was really, really, really cool. And what I remember that at the time about Napster is that it wasn't like browsing a store where they just have everything. It was like browsing someone else's library. So if you like their music here, you might like their other music. You could find new music that way. Exactly. exactly. And yeah. it took so long and was costly even to download one song. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, you had these uh, back then. It was probably fourteen uh, four modems still. You know, you were. Uh, I, I used to have to queue up uh, songs to download uh, over the night because sure, it would literally take an hour per song, two hours per song. So back then, music wasn't just like it is today, where you go on iTunes and you can stream everything and everything's free and everything yeah, yeah. available and open. Back then, you had to actually talk to people and figure out what you wanted. And I think we actually had better collections of music back then. Than I think we did. We had more variety, whereas now it's more like hits and everybody's into the same 10 artists. And it's just too easy to share music now. It like is. Back it then is. the difficulty in sharing led to people actually uh, caring about what they were listening to and not just clicking a Spotify button or whatever you want to. Yeah, it just plays it for itself now. The computer creates a radio station for you. It's, and again, it's always kind of the same poppy hit songs. It's never really like an interesting radio station, although they say AI is getting better, so I guess it's going to fix all that. 
<laughs> Some of the AI is getting pretty cool, but I, um, in general, I don't feel that my musical enjoyment has increased in the last 10 years. Yeah. It's gotten diluted. There was a, a very exciting point where the MP3s opened everything up and suddenly you had all the music and then something else happened with the streaming and now you have access to some music and it's easier to get some but not others and there's a lot of searching to really get past it, that. It feels really layer. independent too. I don't feel like it's not... So back in Napster, for anybody who's not familiar, back in the Napster days it kind of had like an IRC client built in. Mm -hmm. So you would be sitting here talking with some other people that had... So you'd search for a song that you wanted. So say I liked whatever... Uh, public domain free song out there that I was going to go and uh, download for myself through Napster. Sure. I would search for that and it would show me the users that had it. And mm -hmm. then I could go browse that user's library, talk to them, see what uh, other songs they had and discover new music. And it mm -hmm. was like a process. It wasn't just like clicking a button and uh, being fed uh, unlimited music as much sure, as you can listen. Sure. Uh, so well, yeah, and some cool. of the servers would have a lot of stuff and some of the servers have very little stuff and there was a whole, you know, yeah, you find so a good one, you'd be like, wow, this guy's got a great music collection and that's where you're going to get those hits of and artists you have heard of. And that's where it was even yeah. worse because this guy would be popular then and uh, you'd have to wait a day to download even one song. I mean, uh, I had an example of that. I really I, I like Grateful Dead and Fish and some of these jam bands and... Uh, there was a guy on Napster that had a ton of these soundboard recordings from yeah, shows, yeah. and uh, you'd have to wait just literally in line for days before he had enough bandwidth on his uh, 56k or whatever <laughs> sure, modem to. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it, it, but yeah, I think uh, Napster was one of the coolest things. Uh, uh, Bitcoin is obviously one of the coolest things in uh, my computing history. Yeah, yeah. But well, uh, I, I thought the MP3 when I got it was a really amazing thing, and yeah. I, I instantly knew I was like, "Oh, these are, you know, a wave file is this big, and an MP3 is a tenth of the size." And I was like, "Oh, we could do a lot with this. Like, we're gonna, you know, this is big." It changed the world, especially the um, when they came out, and it wasn't even an iPod, but when they came out with those first MP3 players. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, just being able to change the music, not buying CDs anymore mm. was such a, a revolution. But well, we were so locked into the track order, like having a different track order, which you could do on like Winamp. You could move your files around, you had fantastic playlists, like playlists were so big. I remember Winamp. That brings me back to something else I wanted to retrace a little bit, mm -hmm. which is, uh, so the reason I had a Mac in the beginning, and then eventually I was using Winamp was I could remember when uh, for Christmas, after I started becoming kind of a computer nerd, and I was spending literally 16 hours a day on the computer every minute that I wasn't in school. This is probably when I'm 13, 14, 15 sure. years old. I remember I'd, I'd come home every day and use BBSs. I would dial into BBSs and play BBS games, and that was my life, and that's what I loved. I did the BBS stuff a little bit, but when it was like SSH BBSs that were just cool because they were hard to use so it kept all the mainstream people out well and they were connected to the internet too that's a very advanced bbs to be on the internet you know? yeah when so, i was uh, uh when i was first computing it was already internet days i wasn't uh, i never used a, i never dialed into a bbs i had aol i had aol yeah, forever yeah. i probably called those people 500 times <laughs> when i for random things because i couldn't something wasn't working and sure sure but then eventually my parents realized that I was actually interested in computers and that it was uh, gonna, that it was more than a typewriter, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And they tried to buy me, I think it was a G4 it was called. It was oh, the wow. new, uh, the brand new Mac. Uh, and remember in school back in, when I was growing up, in school we used apples. It sure. was the old All apples the with the big yeah. floppy disks. Mm -hmm. And that's what, we, uh, that's what we learned on. So my dad always had Windows. That's what, you know, sure. everybody that has a corporate job. Business and has world, a, yeah, yeah. They yeah, have an absolutely. IBM. It's the international business machine. Of course. It's, uh, yeah, so um, he was always uh, Windows, Windows, Windows. Yeah, Why are we yeah. buying Mac? Why are we paying more for Apple? And I'm like, Dad, please, please, please. <laughs> Finally, I talked him into it, and he ordered me. It was $4,000. This is back in the nineties, four thousand dollars. And for a kid, that's impossible. Like you could never you could work all weekends, you could do paper routes. For ten years, yeah. Ten no, years you never get four grand yeah, when no. I was a kid. No. But then Apple didn't do the supply chain shit right. And I never after three months they canceled the order. And that's when I got my first Windows computer. Huh. And that's when I was using Winit. But well, there uh, you go. it's kind of weird because now everybody uses Apple. And back when I was a kid, 
Apple was kind of like the uh, everybody thought they were on their way out. That they, yeah, uh, yeah. There were some rough times there for Apple. I know at one point uh, they were talking that the brand was more valuable than the company, and maybe they should just give up on the computer things and start doing soda. And if it was Apple Cola, it was Pepsi, Coke, and Apple. Oh, they're solid. I mean, the brand recognition alone, they would have been the number three soda company. And until the iPod. I think after the that, that, they, yeah. that was really a uh, revolutionary move. Uh, and again, putting the MP3s on a hard drive, the portability, the technology just getting better and better. So after you worked with MP3s, how did you get into Bitcoin? Okay, so I mean, that's a bit of a long story. Uh -huh. um, I want to make one last comment on the music, though, sure, sure. which is that it's not just about um, digital formats, it's about access to media. Mm. And the fact that now you don't have to go to a record store that only has records that a certain producer has an agreement with a chain of record stores or whatever. You can literally, uh, it's free to listen to, if Tom is playing his uh, banjo at night, I can... Uh, download it tomorrow there it is everything's there yeah so to get into bitcoin is a bit of a, a long story i mean um did you hear about it early i mean i know you're an early bitcoiner mike's been doing the bitcoin atms for quite a long time um, yeah but i mean i i read about it on slash dot a couple months later the code came out i thought it was amazing my computer programmer roommate didn't and then i put it in the back of my head for two or three years <laughs> and that's my big intro and it's unfortunate because of course i didn't buy it but uh I guess I'll just be honest about my entry into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, so I was living in Tenerife in Spain, and I'm an American citizen, so uh, you're only allowed to stay for three months. Mm -hmm. And this is back in 2010. So I was looking for, I just sold my uh, medical marijuana store in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I was traveling the world a little bit, trying to relax, and I was hanging out at a hostel in Tenerife. Mm -hmm. Spent many months there. Um, I had overstayed, I hadn't overstayed, I was about to overstay my visa and was looking for a passport. Yeah. So I went on uh, Old Silk Road and uh, <laughs> I, I sent Mount Gox, a Western Union, <laughs> for, uh, for about 5,500 pounds yeah. so that I could buy a uh, illegal English passport. <laughs> and uh, then I uh, sobered up or something and realized that I didn't ever want to get caught at a border with an illegal passport. Yeah, you definitely don't want to do that. So I, uh, I had this 5,500 pounds worth of Bitcoin sitting on Mount Gox. Huh. And I f forgot about it. I mean, sure. I went down, this is when I moved to Argentina. So yeah, I, wasn't, yeah. I didn't want to legally stay in Europe. Decided, let's go down to South America. It's cheap. You can travel around. It's a nice place to backpack. Yeah. And the weather's nice uh, when it's European winter. Mm -hmm. So that's when I went down to Argentina. A couple years later, I hear, or maybe a year later, a year and a half, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure exactly, on Bloomberg, they're talking about Bitcoin. Huh. I said, oh, shit, I forgot about that. I have <laughs> uh, this Bitcoin over in Mount Cox. Yeah. I should go ahead and sell that sure. and get rid of it because I'm never going to, um, you know, I, I forgot I even had it. Yeah, yeah. And, well, so that's when I went to uh, log into Mt. Gox and I saw that Bitcoin had already gone up a bunch. Huh. And then I said, well, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, I'm going to sell this. Yeah, yeah. So I went on local Bitcoins and I uh, sold my Bitcoin, noticed that there was a 10% difference in the price that people were paying, uh, sending me a bank transfer versus mm. the price that Mt. Gox was charging. Yeah. And uh, at the time I was still really new. and. Uh, I assume that a lot of this is because your average uh, person doesn't send many international wires or sure. know how to, I went to business school in Japan. I feel very comfortable working with uh, companies over there. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I was wrong about that one with the uh, Gox. <laughs> that one didn't work out. No, <laughs> not too much. But again, it, it wasn't a Japanese guy. <laughs> that is true. It was, it was a, a French, French guy. guy. So, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I got into Bitcoin. And then uh, after that, I realized that if I could make money buying and selling Bitcoin, why not? So, uh, so arbitrage. Yeah. Arbitrage was your first major opportunity, and it kind of lines up to the Bitcoin ATMs because that's again kind of arbitrage. You're you're buying it, you're selling it in the machine, you get a little extra bump. You buy it again, you sell the machine, you get extra. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a perfectly natural, normal business taking advantage of um, inconsistencies in, in the market, market. prices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was on my way to San Jose for the first uh, Bitcoin conference. I almost went to that. I should have gone. It c I kick myself all the time on that I one. was sitting in the plane. I'd used some frequent flyer miles that I got from my credit card. 
I was sitting in first class on the plane coming over from, I think it was in Spain at the time, I'm not sure, but I was <laughs> coming over the U.S. and I'm sitting next to this guy in first class who is the, uh, well, now retired, was the dean of Purdue. Huh. And uh, he says, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to San Jose for a Bitcoin conference. Yeah. I says, Bitcoin, really? And I said, yeah. And this is in like... 2011 or 2010 so nobody knew what Bitcoin the fact was. that he had heard of it is, is crazy at that point yeah, exactly he's, he's listening really well I it's mean, different yeah. now now i get on an airplane anywhere and people say what do you do and i say oh, i'm going to a bitcoin conference oh i've heard about that can you explain how this works ah uh, yeah there it is <laughs> then it's a job <laughs> but 10 years ago it was or not 10 whatever years ago it seems like 10 it seems like 100 years ago yeah, yeah. but uh back in the early days literally every time you went anywhere and mentioned what you did you had like a 30 or 45 minute conversation about, because you didn't want to just leave it at, oh, it's like digital currency. You had to explain. There's no governments, oh. there's no banks, there's yeah. no, it's on the internet. Oh, yeah, it changes everything, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what I always used to get is you'd say, oh, I'm into Bitcoin. They're like, oh, you must be one of those drug dealers from the Silk Road or oh, we some heard kind that of a lot. government criminal thing. And we I'm like, no, I just think it's cool. I'm a computer guy, you know? <laughs> this is, we don't have a lot of time today, but uh, I have another great, uh, great story for you uh, yeah, involving yeah. Mt. Gox, a Polish bank, some police, and <laughs> uh, some very interesting questions. Oh, we'll have, to, we'll have to do a follow-up, man. We'll have to come back and do another one. But let's go back to where we were, which is, uh, so I'm on this plane with this guy that used to be a teacher, or not a teacher, a dean of a school. Sure. He's heard about Bitcoin, coincidentally, which is weird because the Bitcoin conference only had about 200 people at it, yeah. and uh, those were the only people in the world that ever <laughs> That was it. They were all there <laughs> in one room, yeah. <laughs> which is a whole other topic, which is the difference between the conferences then and now. But yeah, yeah. So he says, yeah, my son is a developer. He works for J.P. Morgan huh. as a um, security auditor, penetration testing sure. for their um, website stuff and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And he says he's writing a robot for BTCE that uh, <laughs> does arbitrage. And I said, no fucking way. That's exactly what you're into, <laughs> man. Like, what like, a thing. What a so thing. At, no, at this point, I wasn't into arbitrage. Yeah. At this oh, point, yeah. I was still just learning. I was oh. still just like, man, you can sell it for more than you can buy it. So anyways, I went to this conference. This kid wasn't at the conference, and this guy wasn't going to the conference. Yeah, it just yeah. was so happened we happened to be on the same international yeah. flight on our way there. And so we got on the phone in the airport when we landed, and I talked to his son, and I hired him. And the guy's got a PhD, he's brilliant. Sure, yeah, and yeah. he developed these arbitrage robots for me that would trade uh, in all sorts of exchanges all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, we would sometimes just even trade, like for example, from euros to US dollars only on BTCE or only <laughs> on one exchange. So we weren't even always doing arbitrage between no, different No, it wasn't even exchanges. Bitcoin. It was just having access to these new markets where there was new in, you know, in inequalities or whatever you say. Exactly, and yeah. there's all sorts of one thing that Bitcoin is really, really, really good at is determining a true value. Mm. So uh, there is a lot of manipulation and there is a lot of uh, nonsense in the Bitcoin markets, but in general, if an exchange is 10% higher than another exchange, there's a reason for that. And Bitcoin is very good at finding a, uh, a true value of what a Bitcoin in a different exchange or a different country or a different bank is worth. Yeah. But so yeah, so we started doing the arbitrage trading and then I spent uh, two, three years basically flying around the world, setting up corporations and bank accounts in countries that were just opening Bitcoin exchanges. So uh -huh. when they had their first exchange, the prices would be much different there than in other exchanges. Sure. So I would go, I'd set up a corporation, set up a bank account, we'd program into their API so that we could automatically trade, yep. and we'd start uh, trading. Great. So I spent two or three years doing that, and then between Gox BTC, which was a Chinese knockoff of Mt. Gox, and Mt. Gox itself, as well yeah. as a couple other of these small exchanges that were just entering the market, um, went under, took all my money, mm -hmm. and at the same time, bigger players with more money were starting to get involved in the space, so it was no longer that easy to, uh, you know, if you only have a million bucks that you're circling around in this arbitrage, and it takes three or four days each time you do a withdrawal, and, uh, you can't really make any money compared to somebody that's got 10 million. So then, sure. so as more people got involved, I kind of, and more exchanges uh, robbed me, I ended up uh, getting out of the arbitrage trade. Well, it can be very tough because like you're saying, some exchanges have APIs, you can get that access. Some of them didn't. 
I was always looking at the price and I'd be like, oh, it's cheaper here, it's more expensive here. But the complexity to actually move that money around, I mean, it was like you're saying, the Japan one, you had to have a Japanese bank account to take it from Mt. Gox to Japan, to buy Bitcoin, to Mt. Gox to Japan, to buy Bitcoin. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this or not, but or if your viewers are, but mm -hmm. opening a bank account for a corporation in Japan is nothing like it is in the United States. So, I mean, for starters, in the United States, you go in, you open a bank account for a company or a corporation, it takes a couple of hours. Sure. Uh, in Japan, it's a few month process. Wow. Uh, additionally to that, when you send large wires out of Japan, you have to get the person you're sending to a, approved and all this kind of stuff. So it's huh. not, it's a whole different ballpark. This is why everybody wasn't just withdrawing money out of Mt. Gox and it was higher. That's right. Uh, I'm stuck. Yeah. So I got bored with the arbitrage. Well, got broke with the arbitrage because um, <laughs> due to a few different exchanges going under and uh, in general, poor management of uh, everything because we were trying to move really, really fast. Sure. So uh, at the time, I thought it was more important to move really, really fast than it was to uh, be slow and methodical. Yeah. So. Well, it was. It was the early times. It was a gold rush. It I mean, was a, a wild, lot, wild fucking. West there's a lot of potential then, for getting there first. I mean, it really does give you a setup. So. In the end, I don't regret moving too fast. I just wish that I had. Uh, had more more help, more people, more like uh, if I could go back now, what I would do is I would have hired ten lawyers <laughs> and ten uh, MBAs yeah. and told them to follow me around the world for the last five years because <laughs> uh, then we wouldn't have so much uh, losses over nonsense. It's sure. just Yeah, but uh, so yeah, got bored with the arbitrage. Kind of uh, wasn't making any money on it anymore, and uh, lots of other people were competing now. And it was becoming a thing where arbitrage was no longer just about exploiting the differences in prices at different exchanges, but more about trying to intentionally disrupt other people's arbitrage robots. And it was there starting to go. get mean. And yeah. So then I was uh, kind of upset and depressed and trashed and in Miami at the first Miami conference. And uh, Anthony said, uh, I was like, man, I don't know what I'm doing. And I know an Anthony from the first conference. He says, yeah. uh, well, go talk to this Abdul. He, uh, he just started an ATM company, and uh, we have their prototype in our Toronto Bitcoin Center, embassy, or whatever they're calling yeah, it yeah. there. And so I went over and I had a beer with Abdul, and I bought their first machine, Abdul's from BitAccess. And, nice. And uh, yeah, so five years later, uh, I'm still stuck with the same stupid decision I made one night drunk in Miami dealing with Bitcoin ATMs, but <laughs> it's been a fun ride. That's good. So you went all over the world installing Bitcoin ATMs. What kind of countries did you install them in? So at the moment, we, uh, we operate in uh, 18 or 19 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of partners, joint ventures, uh, companies that manage machines for us. We're obviously not doing this all directly ourselves. Sure. But uh, yeah, in the five years, I've been all over the world, uh, really cool places, met all sorts of really, really interesting people. I, uh, I traveled a lot even before Bitcoin, but um, it was always like traveling alone. When you travel as a Bitcoiner, especially these days, pretty much every city, every country, everywhere I go, there's other people to hang out with and meet up with and do business with. And I guess that's really actually the coolest part about Bitcoin is just the fact that it drops the boundaries and borders and nonsense and regulations and mm -hmm. things like this that prevent innovation and allows communities to really interact on a, uh, a basic level. I really feel that too. A lot of the friends I've made now from Bitcoin conferences are my real friends, not just my Bitcoin friends. And then just, we have so much in common. You know, a lot of people are computer geeks or they're into money or they're into governments or politics, these kind of things. But then they come to the Bitcoin com conference and then we have tons in common and it's just great to meet these people. And yeah, maybe that is the, the real thing we're getting out of it. Cause you know, what if Bitcoin and all the cryptos went to zero tomorrow and they broke the encryption and the whole thing's done and it's over. I, I like to think that we would still have maybe a conference like this to hang out. And maybe every couple of years we'd get everybody together and be like, oh yeah, I remember Things those crazy Bitcoin days. really interesting yeah, if yeah. it had a catastrophic failure, like something in the encryption or something sure. that could be fixed. Because immediately everybody that's just here to make money would be gone. Oh yeah. And all the nerds would be left trying to fix it. We so. would be. We'd be like, fix <laughs> it. Or, and there would be, it would be all new discussions. We'd be like, well, what, what can we do? Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we move around? Can we do this? And 
everybody would be looking for the solution and I even if it was like something impossible I get the feeling that we would just keep looking forever I've seen just, you, you know. at many 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 events over the past few years yeah, yeah. and I think you and I agree on one thing and that is that the community of Bitcoin is probably one of the coolest things that we're actually creating yeah the currency itself is great the technology is great but um, this might be one of the most revolutionary ways to bring different kinds of people from different languages, mm -hmm. different races, different cultures, all on the same table, the same yeah. place. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think that is really the more important part of Bitcoin than even its value as a currency. Mm. It's changing our motives and realigning everything. It's almost like instead of governments or instead of like an allegiance like a football team or a hockey team once you have your allegiance to bitcoin you're outside of the rest of the system because we're building a whole brand new system out there and it's going to have everything but we're going to build it ourselves and we're going to have control over it that used to sound crazy because five years ago we'd be some uh, random uh, people at a conference and everybody that we'd see on a bus or a plane or a train and we tell about bitcoin would say uh, well, you know, we'd have to spend 30 minutes explaining of why course. this is going to yeah, be valuable. Yeah. At this point, there's already actually a really large community all over the world of Bitcoin users, of Bitcoin uh, developers, mm -hmm. of people that run Bitcoin businesses. So I think we're already past this. Uh, I might regret saying this, but I think we're already past this point of no return where uh, Bitcoin's not going away. And we've proven that there is a value. And I think a lot of that value comes from the community. Yep. Well, thanks so much for the interview, Mike. Really enjoyed talking to you, and I'd love to talk to you again and get some more stories about the old days and, and what it was like. Absolutely, anytime. It's always great to see you. Um, you've, you you literally must be traveling full-time going to these conferences because it's uh, I literally see you every <laughs> conference I go to, and I know you're going to more conferences than that as well. Yep, I've got a couple more planned for this trip, then I'm home, then I'm going back, and I pick up two more. And then I, I think I'm going to have to go out one more time this year. So it's, I'm going from uh, no Europe trips in my entire life to uh, maybe this is my second this year. And if I pull off the others, I might do four. Uh, so that would be pretty impressive. And, and for me, just to be in Europe is such a treat to see the history and the old buildings and just also, different cultures. I'm, it's really you know, cool so at much. this blockchain hotel here. I've never been here before. This is the first time. Mm -hmm. I know Gideon well for many years. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. It's really, really nice and relaxing and calm here. And uh, maybe in the background, it looks like it's a little dark. I mean, it is Germany, but it's uh, gray. It's gray today. It's a great place. <laughs> it's a great place, even though it's gray. <laughs> they should put that on the cards for Germany. Well, very good. Thank, well, thanks so much. Always Mike. a pleasure really to see you. Appreciate it, man.